Hello everyone. As we settle down, I'm going to invite all of you lovely people seated here, those watching us from the venue and those watching us on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. There's no distance with the spirit. I'm sure you're going to be equally blessed tonight. Tonight is the last evening for our 242 this summer semester. So it promises to be exciting, especially with what Pastor Child will be teaching tonight. But as always, if you have any questions for Pastor Chad as he teaches, please send them via text to the number that will be displayed on the screen behind him as he teaches. And also, if you'd like to follow along with the teaching tonight, please go to the Cross Assembly app. In the notes section, you see it both in English and in Spanish. Feel free to take whichever one you're more comfortable with. All right, so with that, let's pray and invite Pastor Chad on stage. We thank you, Heavenly Father, another opportunity to sit at your feet as Mary did to hear the words that will transform us. We pray your word will break forth in our souls as light, giving wisdom to the simple. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brother Alfred. Uh, and he asked me, he said, like, Chad, last time I did this, you told everybody, kind of embarrassed me, that I sounded like a... Uh, uh, African uh, Barry White, so please don't mention that, don't talk about it, don't bring it up, don't, don't remind everybody that I sound like a, uh, an African Barry White. All right, everybody good? Hey, so this is the last teaching for the semester, but in July, I'm very excited about this. Really, the heartbeat of Cross Assembly is missions, and it's real simple. We believe Jesus is coming back soon. We believe that the, the default position of the human race is the human race is lost, and if they die lost, they spend eternity lost apart from God. And so Jesus is the only way to salvation. So we are commissioned by Jesus to go into all the world with the gospel. So here's what we're doing in July. How many of you know when you start coming against demonic forces with the gospel, Satan doesn't take the sitting down. We're not going to just keep sending out missionaries and Satan is not going to counterattack. It is amazing how many attacks our missionaries are going through right now. In fact, I got a text. Uh, let's see, it's just a couple hours ago. Let's see if I can find what time it was. It was a text at 3.52 p.m. One of our missionaries said that a, a Muslim background believer who's been using by God to advance the gospel in the Middle East, he has disappeared for three days. The government has taken him. Family doesn't know where he is. Got a wife and five kids. He said, would you just share that with Cross Assembly and ask them to be praying for this individual? Every day now, there's a new demonic attack on missionaries that Darl and I are hearing either through email, phone call, text. Satan is really hitting hard. Our greatest weapon against Satan is prayer and fasting. And so in the month of July, first Sunday, uh, first Wednesday, second Wednesday, third Wednesday, we're going to be gathering in here and praying for specific missionaries. We've got a great thing planned. We're going to have missionary interviews. We're going to come against Satan in a big way through the month of July for those first three Wednesdays. The, 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 next, the fourth Wednesday is going to be Kids Week, so we won't be here uh, doing that. But join me starting next week in just praying for God to begin to move in a mighty way and counterattack what the enemy is doing there overseas. We're going to start that next Wednesday night here. And I know next Wednesday is, what date is that? Is that the third? third? So I know it's the day before the 4th of July. If you, you know, if you don't come, I'm not going to be mad at you. It doesn't bother me if you're not concerned about lost people going to heaven. I'm joking. <laughs> but for those of you who can be here next week, let's just gather together and spend some time praying for missionaries, okay? So let's do a quick review Tongues, speaking in tongues, is used in three ways in the New Testament. Number one, we talked about this last week, the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week, and we said of the five passages in Acts of people having this encounter called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, three specifically say they spoke in tongues. One implies they spoke in tongues. So that's initial evidence. Number two, in places like 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks about the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. We won't hit that this semester. We'll do that in the fall. We'll hit the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. But that's the second way it's used. 
The third way tongues is used is, and here's why I'm gonna, I want to hit this hard tonight. Tongues as a prayer language or praying in the Spirit. Praying in tongues. And there's several passages in the New Testament that talk about praying in the Spirit. First of all, uh, we've got 1 Corinthians 14. So turn there if you would. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14. Paul, in this passage, talks about two kinds of praying. Two kinds of prayers. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. It's interesting. Verse 15, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. So Paul says there's two kinds of prayers. Number one, Praying in the Spirit. Uh, verse 15, when he says, I'll pray in the Spirit, is he talking about his Spirit inside of him? Or is he talking about the Holy Spirit who lives inside of him? I happen to believe he's talking about the Holy Spirit because there is a definite article right there. Do you see the word the? That's a definite article. That, more often than not, in the Bible, indicates the Holy Spirit. The prior verse seems to indicate his Spirit. And so there's a scholar. Now, if you want a bona fide, genuine Pentecostal scholar, jot this name down. You can find his stuff online. His name is Gordon Fee, F-E-E. And so when Gordon Fee talks about praying in the Spirit, he uses the uppercase and lowercase because what he says is, according to this passage, it's my, holy, my spirit combined with the Holy Spirit living in me that prays through me. But, but here's my point. In this passage, Paul says there's two kinds of praying. Number one, praying in the Spirit. And then number two, second kind is praying with understanding. That's rational, logical, organized praying. And so, before I became a Pentecostal, I only prayed in that second way, and that's fine. I would think, God, I have a need right here. I would think about this need. I would put that need into human language, into English, and I would speak that prayer request to God. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a great way of praying. But I neglected that first way of praying until I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I understood that there is a way to pray that kind of bypasses, because Paul says my mind is unfruitful, it bypasses logic, and I pray in a deeper way. Because this is what you need to understand. Listen, not all communication not all language is cognitive, okay? We think it is. Paul says, no, there's a deeper way that's even deeper than cognition. For example, um, if I were to do this, you, you, you see me, I go, ah, I've, I've not uttered a human word. I've not uttered an English word. But you can tell I'm what? I'm frustrated. Ah, kind of comes from deep inside of me. Um, I'm at a game, and I go, woohoo! I've not uttered an English word. But my, the way I've just kind of, something has come out of it, you realize, wow, he's excited. And it's almost like Paul is saying, there's a way of praying where you put your logic into English language, and you lift that up to God, and that's great. But there's also a deeper way called praying in the Spirit that bypasses your mind, and it's actually a deeper way of praying, okay? Um, it's interesting as well. Uh, Paul is, is really talking about his own prayer life because I want you to see what he says in verses 18 and 19. Those of y'all who think tongues is everything. Everything goes back to speaking in tongues, tongues, tongues. Well, Paul says in verse 18 and 19, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all, yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Isn't that interesting? I speak in tongues, he says, more than anybody else. But when I come to church, he said, I don't really want to speak in tongues that much. Um, one charismatic scholar says, quote, this is Paul's somewhat exaggerated way of saying he almost never speaks in tongues in church. He, he almost never practices this gift of tongues in the church. No, but in his own prayer closet, he goes crazy. He prays in tongues all the time. That, that's pretty much what he's saying, Okay. So here's what I say. When people want to argue about tongues, well, I don't believe tongues is for today, Chad. I come to cross assembly, but I have a problem with the thing of tongues. You know what I always say? Here's what I say. 
well, don't speak in tongues then. I don't, I don't care. No skin off my back. I'm not, I'm not here to convert you to tongues. I'm here to convert you to Jesus. But if you're not into tongues, don't speak in tongues. I will say this. You're missing out on a great, beautiful, powerful gift that has absolutely changed my life. But if you're not in tongues, don't speak. I don't care. Don't speak in tongues. And that's kind of what Paul is saying here as well. Okay. Now, that's not the only passage in the New Testament that talks about praying in the Spirit. Ephesians 6, spiritual warfare passage. Go there if you would. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand and skip down in verse 18. He gives the armor of God, but we always skip verse 18. Verse 18 is part of the armor uh, and it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And there's the definite article again, which means he's talking about the Holy Spirit. That's the second place in the New Testament, where he talks about praying in tongues or praying in the Spirit. Jude 1, in the context is uh, there's a spiritual struggle with wicked people dividing the body of Christ. And Jude says this in verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, look at this, praying in the Holy Spirit. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And so this thing of praying in the Spirit, it's not an ancillary thing. I've just showed you three passages in the New Testament right there where the Bible talks about praying in the Spirit. But I think probably the greatest um, in-depth teaching on what it means to pray in the Spirit or pray in tongues is Romans chapter 8. So I got a, I mean, I got a lot to cover. I'm sorry I'm going through fast, but I'm going fast because I got a lot to cover. I'm also going fast because I'm so excited about this. This spiritual discipline absolutely changed my life. Uh, I'm talking on Sunday about one of the, my favorite subjects, how to combat fear and worry and anxiety. I wish there was just one magic bullet that would make all of your anxiety go away. I think it's, uh, you attack this from different things. You know one thing that's helped me with anxiety and worry is praying in the Spirit. When I started just to pray in tongues, um, man, it, it really broke something when it came to this worry and anxiety. I'll, I'll hit that more in a second. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about this. But look at Romans 8. In, in Romans 8, Paul focuses on the ministry of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. And in that chapter, Paul says the Holy Spirit does several things for believers. Number one, the Holy Spirit testifies that we're God's children, verse 16. Don't ever doubt that you're a child of God. You belong to the Father. And according to Romans 8, 16, the Holy Spirit is there to say, calm down, God loves you, you may have messed up, but you're still a child of God. That's one thing the Holy Spirit does. Then he says, number two, the Holy Spirit, he's our down payment, he's our guarantee of greater things to come, verse 23. One day God's gonna raise our bodies up from the dead, we're gonna go to heaven, be with Jesus forever in these glorified bodies, it's gonna be great. And you're like, Jesus, how do, you, how do I know you're gonna do all that for me in the future? He said, because I've given you a down payment. That down payment is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just a little taste of something greater to come. That's the second thing the Holy Spirit does. And then the third thing, according to this chapter, Romans 8, that the Holy Spirit does is he helps us to pray. So look at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us, helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Paul's talking right there. He's getting in-depth on praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues. So, What do you mean by praying in the Spirit? What do you mean when you talk about praying in tongues? Let me give you my working definition of this. Here's my definition. It's copyrighted. If you use it without my permission, I'm going to sue you. I'm joking. But here's, here it is. My working definition of praying in the Spirit is this. Praying in the Spirit is the phenomenon by which the Holy Spirit residing in the believer prays to God on behalf of that believer through the voice of that believer 
with either a heavenly or earthly language. Now, I want to break down that definition. That's my working definition of praying in tongues or praying in the Spirit. So let's break that down. Remember I said the first part of this is uh, what is praying in tongues? It's the Holy Spirit residing in the believer praying. Look at verse 26. Paul says in verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. We don't know how we pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes. The Spirit himself prays. So that's important. Paul says when you as a charismatic or Pentecostal come to the prayer closet and you begin to just quietly pray in tongues, here's what Paul, this is what he's saying right here. It's actually the Holy Spirit inside of you that's praying through you. Now, again, um, the, the spirit and the prophet is subject to the prophet. You don't date, you don't go out into a, 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 a whatever. You don't pass out. You don't go crazy. But what he's saying is, at that moment, it's a weird thought, isn't it? It's the Holy Spirit who's actually praying through you. That's what he's saying right there. So look back at my definition. What is praying in the spirit? Well, it's the Holy Spirit residing in the believer praying. And look at this. He prays to God. Now, I told you, I'm an equal opportunity offender. I offend the Baptists and I offend the Pentecostals. And here's where I offend the Pentecostals, okay? Did you know, whether it be the gift of tongues, the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or praying in the Spirit, when you're speaking in tongues, you're always praying to God? Because here's how most of the prophecy or the tongues and interpretations in Pentecostal churches do. Okay, it's always as if God is speaking to us through that person. In the Pentecostal service, they'll stand up and say, you know, la da ba da da ma ma ma, and then somebody will interpret it. Oh, yea, now my children, turn neither to the left nor to the right. It's as if God is speaking to us through tongues. That's not biblical. In the Bible, tongues are always directed to God. I was in a Pentecostal worship service a few weeks ago where a message in tongues was given, and again, it was as if God is speaking to the body. That message blessed me. I think God, in his grace, was still kind enough to bless. It was actually, the message was something I was dealing with, so I received that. But strictly speaking, tongues in the Bible is not God speaking down to us. It's always us Speaking to God. Let me give you some examples of this. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For the one who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to people. Speaks to God. It's pretty clear right there, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in a tongue, implied when I speak in tongues, I'm speaking to God. 1 Corinthians 14, 28. But if there's no interpreter, uh, I somebody to interpret the message in tongues, He is to keep silent in the church and have him speak to himself and to God. Acts 2.11, day of Pentecost. People are speaking in tongues, and they said, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the mighty deeds of God. It was God-directed. Does that make sense? Because, again, in 99.9999999% of Pentecostal services, somebody gives a message in tongues, the interpretation seems to always be it's like God speaking to us. I think God can still bless that. God can still honor that. But if you want to go by the word of God, tongues is always directed at God, okay? Um, So go back to my definition. What is praying in the Spirit? Praying in the Spirit is um, the phenomenon by which the Holy Spirit, residing in a believer, prays to God, it's Godward. Look at this. On behalf of that believer, the, the Greek word for intercedes, verse 26, and it's very interesting. It means to intercede. It means to deal with a situation on behalf of somebody else. So this is beautiful. Look, I had a situation today about this where, where there was a major situation I had to do. I've actually had two situations, major situations that I had to deal with today. I am brain fried. And um, in my English, I kept praying God, here's how I think this needs to be resolved. God, please move in this direction. And something just didn't seem right. And then in the second situation, I was like, God, and I just think you need to do this. And God, please do that. And please have this person do this. And something didn't seem right. Have you ever been there? It just, it just, my, my prayers just, something's blocking. See what I started to do? 
I started to pray in tongues. Because when I pray in tongues, I feel it's the Holy Spirit inside of me saying to the Father, Father, ignore everything Chad just said. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He he doesn't know the whole situation, so ignore that. God, Father, here's what what needs to be done in this situation. does, Does that make sense? And so uh, there are times where I think I'm smarter than God. I know how a situation needs to be resolved. This passage says the Holy Spirit starts to pray on your behalf and says, time out. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Just don't listen to him. Here's, Father, what needs to happen in this situation. Don't you think the Holy, because look, the Spirit of God contains the mind of God. He knows, just like the Father does, what needs to happen in this situation. Does, does that make sense? So when I pray in tongues, it's now the Holy Spirit praying through my lips on my behalf. Uh, look at this. Um, th- okay, look at the next part of my definition. So let's go back. What's praying in tongues? Praying in the tongues is the phenomenon by which the Holy Spirit residing in a believer prays to God on behalf of that believer. Now look at my next part of the definition. Through the voice of that believer. So here's the question. Is praying in the Spirit audible? Is it spoken prayer like we Pentecostals or Charismatics believe? Or is it silent prayer? Because, and I'm not bashing the Baptists. I love my Southern Baptist brothers and sisters. I love their passion for the Word of God. You've heard me say that. But as a Baptist, I was, I was taught this. No, no, praying in the Spirit, it's silent prayer. It means you're just kind of sitting there silently and you're praying in the Spirit. How many maybe Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptists were, were taught that here? Okay, praying in the spirit is silent. Here's why I don't think it's silent prayer. Several reasons. Um, number one, do you know silent prayer was actually rare in the ancient world? Did you know that? It's interesting. If you look at the ancient world, ancient Judaism, ancient Christianity, we see this in scripture. When people prayed, they did it out loud. When they read their Bible, Do you know they did it out loud? They didn't do a lot of silent reading. Let me give you some examples of this. In Joshua 1, 8, where God says, Joshua, you will meditate on the word of God day and night. You read that before? Do you know meditate in Hebrew means to mutter or to growl? Literally, it means you will mutter the word of God day and night. That's audible. Y'all remember the story in 1 Samuel 1, 13, where Hannah is praying for a child at the tabernacle. Y'all remember this? And she thought she's by herself. And this priest hears her, and he thinks she's drunk. Eli's like, this, is, this lady's drunk. Implied in that is, even though she was by herself, she wasn't there in quiet prayer. She's praying out loud. It's kind of interesting. If you look at the story of, of the tax collector in Luke 18, he's praying out loud. God have mercy on me, a sinner, even though it's just him and God. And then in uh, Acts 8.30, the Ethiopian eunuch, you remember this story? He's by himself in the middle of the desert reading the Bible, but it says Philip hears him reading the Bible. Implication, he's not reading it silently. He's reading it out loud. So why do I believe that praying in the Spirit is not just silently praying? Because that's not how it was done back then. Whether you read the Bible or you prayed, It was always audible, or most of the time it was audible. Uh, Secondly, groaning. Do you see in verse 26, the Holy Spirit, you know, prays with groanings. That implies something audible. Groaning is something generally you do that's that's audible. Uh, Too deep for words. The Greek word is alaletas. It could mean not able to be put into language. And so it could be it's an audible expression of prayer, but it's so deep. Human language can't even capture it, okay? Um, Let's go back to the definition. What is praying in the Spirit? Praying in the Spirit is the phenomenon by which the Holy Spirit, residing in a believer, prays to God on behalf of that believer, through the voice of that believer. Here's my last part of the definition. And we talked about this a little bit last week. With either a heavenly or an earthly language. And remember 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I speak in the tongue of men which means sometimes when I speak in tongues, it's an unlearned human language. Speaking in tongues of men or of angels, which is um, a, a heavenly language. Uh, in his four-volume commentary on Acts, if you really want to dig into the book of Acts, get this. Uh, Craig Keener, brilliant uh, Bible scholar, 
he cites some two dozen verified cases of individuals speaking in a human language for which they received no prior education. He said, this is documented. There are documented times where individuals are praying in tongues and people are listening and they're like, you're, you're speaking this language. Uh, the, another great one, this is a, a great one, was uh, Mount Perrin Church of God. You ever heard of that in uh, Atlanta, Georgia? Great Church of God. It's pastored by Pastor Paul Walker, uh, not Fast and Furious Paul Walker, different Pastor Wal- uh, Paul Walker. Brilliant man, had a PhD from the University of Georgia and was the pastor of that church. And um, he had a Bible study like this, and then they had a time of worship, and somebody, this old farmer, stood up. They had a recording of this. He gave this message in tongues, and then it's interpreted. And then a scholar who's visiting that church from the University of Georgia is like, where'd you learn classic Greek? He said, I don't know classic Greek. I'm a farmer. I, I, I grow tobacco or corn or whatever. It's like, yeah, you know, you, know, you know classical Greek. You've just spoken a perfect classical Greek. I'm a professor of Greek. And so there's examples after examples of this. And so it's usually, for me, a heavenly language. But there are times God can move and you'll be, be praying in a, a human language. And then the result of this. So I told you last week, we love to quote, quote Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And that is true. But the context makes this so much more beautiful. After the Apostle Paul has talked about, the Holy Spirit reminds you, you're a child of God. The Holy Spirit reminds you, I'm a down pavement. Greater things are to come. The Holy Spirit is there to help you in your prayer language, to pray in a deeper way. Paul says, after all that happens, verse 28, as a result, God's going to cause all things to work together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Isn't isn't that powerful? When you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you, through your lips, God begins to move in a mighty way and causes how many things? All things. I've told you all this before. My, my granny grew up in the rural south. I don't think she graduated from high school. But I tell people all the time, I was like, she was an artist. I was like, what did she paint? She didn't paint anything. She made these things. You ever heard of this term? It's called cat's head biscuits. I guess they call them biscuits, cat head, because they're as big as a cat's head or something. She'd make these beautiful biscuits. And um, she would use the nastiest thing to make these biscuits. Lard, anybody, you know what lard is? It's pig fat, you're right. Salt, just eat salt by itself, it doesn't taste good. Flour, you, you ever just tasted flour before, just raw flour? It does not taste good. Buttermilk, any psychopaths in here who actually like buttermilk? Okay, buttermilk is nasty, some of y'all like it. Buttermilk is, she would take four of the nastiest things, mix them together, do something, and they'd come out these incredible biscuits. And I think about that every time I read that verse. God can take the divorce, he can take the abortion, he can take the moral failing, he can take all the mess in your life and somehow by the power of the Holy Spirit, he has the ability to bring all that and bring something good out of that. God either causes all things to work together for good or he doesn't. There's no in between on this thing. And so for me, that's one of the results of being praying in the Spirit and having this beautiful prayer language. It's it allows God to move and cause all things to work together for good. The second one, I, I meant to get this video. I ran out of time. It was either a 60 minutes documentary or it's a nightline documentary. I think it was 60 minutes, but it could have been nightline, but I think it was 60 minutes. They did years ago a little uh, like 30 minute, 20 minute thing on speaking in tongues. I've, I've seen this, but was, I, I, I'd shared it before. I wish I brought it tonight on speaking in tongues. And there's a lot of naysayers, like, oh, this is just emotion. These Pentecostals are crazy. But they actually had a neuroscientist rig up people's brains and take blood samples and do all this physiological tests. And here's what they found. They said these Pentecostals, when they pray in tongues, we've checked their cortisol. Their cortisol, their stress hormone, drops precipitously. And then we've we've looked at their brain and the relaxation centers of their brain begin to fire up. Cortisol drops, relaxation increases when these crazy people start to pray in tongues. I think there's a spiritual component. 
I also think there's a physical component. And like I said, my life took on a totally different level of relaxation. When I learned, when I'm in, in stressed out, push back the table, get away, go to my room, get on my knees, and just start praying in tongues. And it's amazing how that just calms me down. And so there's, there's power in this thing. So at any rate, I, I, I'm not good at time management. I wanted to hit the gift of tongues this semester. We're going to have to wait until, I guess, September to do that. But uh, again, next week, We'll start three weeks of praying for global missions. And again, we'll have missionaries, videos. It's going to be great. We'll take August off, and then September, we're going to jump back into spiritual gifts, and we'll probably start with the spiritual gift of, uh, of speaking in tongues. Let's see if we had any, uh, any questions here tonight. Um, uh, buh, 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 buh. Let's see. So here's another. If one person is in a prayer group and they speak in tongues, should the group know what's being said? Uh, when is the interpretation applicable? So again, this is a great, great question. Remember, this whole idea of, pray, of, of speaking in tongues and then having an interpretation, that's not what I'm talking about tonight. That is the gift of tongues that takes place when you're in a fellowship of believers. There's worship going on. Somebody begins to worship God, maybe a little bit louder than everybody else. And then somebody interprets it. And remember I said, tongues is directed toward who? Therefore, the interpretation should be God's word. And so, again, that's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about praying in tongues. But in a situation like that, you're with a group. Somebody begins to just praise God in tongues. And the interpretation goes something like this. God, you are great. You are a mighty God. You're an awesome God. We lift you up. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We exalt you. Does that make sense? And that's why I told you last week, some of you who weren't there, weren't here last week, about a friend of ours, mine and Darla's, whose wife died of a horrendous neurological thing. She's in the hospital just babbling incoherently in her final days, and a Jewish doctor walks by, and he didn't just say she's speaking in Hebrew. He said that. He said she's praying in Hebrew. He understood what was coming out of her mouth was Godward, God-directed, okay? But, but this question of the interpretation Okay, if somebody speaks in tongues, there's got to be interpretation. That doesn't go for the initial evidence. We're not talking about the, the gift of praying in tongues. We're talking about the gift of speaking in tongues in a fellowship of believers in a gathering of worship. Okay, so that's a good, good question. Um, here's a good one. Uh, why does the prayer language change? My prayer language sounds different now than it did when I was younger. It's a great question. I don't know. I've noticed the same thing that happened with me. Um, the, the way I pray in tongues now is a little different sounding than it was 20 or 25 years ago. And I don't know what, you know, what the implications are on that, but I've noticed that with my life as well. It's a, it's a great question. Um, here's a great one. For people exploring this time of prayer, or this type of prayer, how can they receive it authentically rather than forced, or are both forms an acceptable offering of prayer to God? That's actually a great question. Here's what I'm against. I'm against manipulation. Uh, I've seen this happen before, where, where somebody wants the baptism of the Spirit, for example, so bad. And so now we're talking about initial evidence. So let's kind of shift gears to initial evidence. And the guy comes, says, okay, well, you want the baptism? Yeah. Repeat after me. Fa la la, fa la la. Ti ta ta, ti ta ta. Now start just saying that real fast. Fa la la, ti ta ta. Fa, you're, praise God, you're speaking in tongues. No, you're not. You're mimicking the parrot, okay? Or you're being a parrot. What I've found is in a situation like this, when you have intense worship, so get some good praise and worship music, shut the door, get by yourself, get on your knees before the Lord. And have you ever had these times of worship where you can just feel the presence of God there? And you know, I know some of it's the music, I get it. And all of a sudden, you just, you just start battling like a little baby to, to, to God. And well, how do I know if I'm speaking in tongues? Is this just me? Is this my emotion? Is it the Holy Spirit? Don't worry about it. Just start praising God. And if you want to babble, you babble. And, and again, if you say, I'm totally against this, this is crazy, then just don't do it, okay? But I, I just say get alone with God with some great praise and worship music. Get on your knees before the Lord. Raise your hand. And a lot of times this just happens, okay? Um, it's a great question. Um, let's see. Here's a good one. Would tongues be the preferred prayer option considering it is the Holy Spirit always praying to praying God's will, 
uh, where we might get it wrong. So I, I think what this person is saying, and if, if this is what they're saying, I kind of agree with it. I don't pray in tongues all the time. There are times where I know exactly what I need to pray for. This loved one is lost. They don't know Jesus. I'm gonna pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask my brother to get saved. I, I ask him to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, send a laborer into his path. How many of y'all got a, a loved one that needs to get saved? One of the most effective things you can do is pray, watch this. Jesus said this, pray that the Father will send laborers Pray this, because you might not be the right person to lead them to Jesus. They know you too well. Father, send somebody in their path, a labor in their path, to come to, to, to share the gospel with them. I know it to pray. And so sometimes I'll just pray in English like that. In the two situations I was talking about today, I was at a loss. So when I'm at a loss, you better believe it, I just pray in tongues, because I'm just assuming the Holy Spirit living in me knows what to pray in a way that I don't. And so that's a great question. Um, let's see. Um, um, so here's a good one since praying in tongues is directed to the father uh, if there's an interpretation is that interpretation about the father actually Paul says this in 1 Corinthians uh, he who prays in an unknown tongue prays to God so there's a triunity to God right here is Jesus God? yes is the Father God? Yes. So sometimes that interpretation could be directed at Jesus because he's God. Now the normal, listen, the normal way of praying is to the Father through Jesus. But are there times in the Bible where people pray to Jesus directly? Absolutely. And so the interpretation will be God. Maybe it's God, maybe it's Father, maybe it's, maybe it's Jesus, but um, that, that's, that's what I mean by God word direct of prayer. So it might not always be the interpretation, it might not be Father, it might be God, or it might be Jesus. Um, you know, here's another great question as well. Does praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues prohibit Satan from understanding your prayers? So let, let me just say this. I've heard this in Pentecostal circles. I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you can't find a Bible verse that says this. In Pentecostal circles, you will hear people say this. I pray in tongues because Satan doesn't understand what's going on, and it confuses him. For example, when I pray in English, God, my brother is lost. God, let me get saved. Satan knows English, and he knows I'm going to try to stand in the way and prevent that prayer from happening. And the, the, the teaching is, but when I pray in tongues, it confuses Satan. He doesn't know what's going on. That may be true. May be true. Challenge is you, you can't find a scripture that, that backs that up. It's just, that's totally conjecture. Does it make sense? So maybe that's true. Maybe it's not that when you pray in a tongue, it confuses Satan. Satan doesn't know what's going on. Um, but that's conjecture. That, that you can't find a scripture that I know of that, uh, that backs it up. That's a good, good question. Um, all right. Gang, listen, let's do this. Let's, let's just spend a few moments. Can we do this? Just spend a few moments praising the Lord. And don't get crazy. I don't want anybody standing up and shouting or whatever. Let's just take a few moments and start focusing on the Lord and his goodness and his faithfulness. And I want you either kind of quietly in English or in tongues to just praise the Father. And, and I'm going to I want to praise him in English. And I'm going to spend just a few moments praising him and worshiping in tongues. And because I'm kind of, I know this is whatever, I'm, I'm dividing hairs here, but because um, this is just a, a corporate time of worship, you don't need to interpret what I'm saying. But I want you to stand up with me. Just do this, stand up with me. And let's just spend a few moments right now. I want you to think about maybe a sin that Jesus forgave you of a cancer he healed you of, a tough time you went through, you didn't think you were ever gonna get out, and God brought you through this thing. You got a time like that? Maybe it's that divorce that almost sunk your ship. You didn't think you were gonna make it, and yet you're here standing victoriously today. I want you, I want us to spend some time just worshiping God for who he is, thanking God for what he's done, and then I'm gonna I want to lead us in prayer. Can we do that right now? Just lift your hands right now. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, th thank you sounds so puny. 
considering all you've done for us. Father, you've brought us through good times. you brought us through bad times. You've been faithful. You've never let us down, Father. God, you've forgiven us of some horrendous stuff in this room. The blood of your son, Jesus Christ, has washed us. And God, we are now more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sons and daughters of the most high God. Father, we have an eternal home waiting for us. Our past has been forgiven. Your spirit's living in us in the present. You're taking us home in the future. God, how can we not be the most happy, joyful people in this world? And so, Father, hear my brothers and sisters right now as they just worship you and praise you in this place. Beloved, just do it out loud right now. Just praise God right now. Bless you, Father. Bless you. Oh, bless you, Father. Bless you. Bless you, God. You are so good. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Oh, God, we exalt you. We exalt you. Bless you. Bless you, living one. Behold, God, you are God. You changeth not. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We exalt you, O King of kings. We exalt you, O Lord of lords. We bless your holy name forever. Father, build us up. Send us out. May we come against the forces of darkness. May we lead this lost and dying world to Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that old prayer that the saints of God have been praying for millennia, that early prayer, Maranatha. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus Christ. We are ready to come home. Father God, thy kingdom come. Father, send your son Jesus back. Father, we are ready to come home to be with you forever. We bless you. We exalt you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the saints of God said, amen and amen. Amen, beloved. Thank you so much. Brother, come on out here. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. You can be seated. Give us some instructions here, brother. You know, a good teacher is the person that makes you do a practicals right outside he's taught. Let's thank God for Pastor Chad. All right, two quick announcements before we transition to the discussion at the table. The first is still on the note of prayer. As Pastor Chad mentioned, July is for prayer. So all through July, every Wednesday, instead of 2.42, we are going to be having a prayer meeting. Now, usually in church, when people say prayer meeting, we have the numbers drop. <laughs> but Jesus didn't say, my house shall be known as a house of worship, as good as that is. Or my house shall be known as a house of wisdom, as good as that is. He said, my house shall be known as a house of prayer. So this July, you can bet on it, there will be all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't be here on a Wednesday evening. I encourage you to fight through that and join us here Wednesday evenings for July so we all pray as a church. If God is going to continue doing amazing things in cross assembly, we have to play our part and be a praying church. Amen. All right. But for the prayer meetings, there will be no child care because we'll have no programs for the children. So it's going to be a family service. So as your children are screaming, you'll be praying louder. Amen. All right. Um, next, I'd like to say a big thank you to every one of us, especially your leaders. If, you, if your leader is sitting in front of you, take a look at them, stare at them, stare into their eyes, and clap for them. <laughs> and those who are on the Zoom, um, the Zoom groups also, this also goes to you. Thank you so much. Summers are tough, and usually... We take the summers off, but with this summer, we did as we've been doing this summer so people that come to the church can join the church in the summer. This semester, we had 165 people not join the church, but join groups. We can praise God for that. And that's all because of the sacrifices of your, of your leaders, especially. And that's why I said clap for them. Because they could have taken a vacation, and there's nothing wrong with the vacation. But they are here sacrificing so the ministry of God can go through on 
in the summer. So thank you all so much for being with us this summer semester. And I'll hand over to your leaders for your discussion tonight. Thank you.